want you to see the complexities of Cuba, not uh, only an only way to look at Cuba. So, what I'm going to try to do is talk to you about Cuban-U.S. relations since December 17. Well, firstly, starting with the Cuban ambassador, I felt that one was very impactful, and he presented a side of history that we don't necessarily get to hear very often. This is a map of Cuba. There are certain things that are important to understand and to understand the American interest in Cuba. Cuba, obviously, the largest island in the Caribbean, no doubt about it. Cuba is the only country in the region that has part of its coast faces the Atlantic, Part of its coast faces the Gulf of Mexico, and all her south coast faces the Caribbean. And the Caribbean, the Panama Canal, and the connection to the Pacific. This means that Cuba is in the middle of things. Cuba is a very tiny country. It's got 11 million people in a world of 7 billion people. Yet somehow this guy, Fidel Castro, managed to become one of the most important personalities of the last century. Even though he came from this little, little tiny, tiny country. Right? So Fidel Castro is obviously not an ordinary person. He's a very exceptional person. It doesn't matter whether you like him, you hate him, what you think about him, facts are facts. Facts are, that's who he is. Right? And I'm sure he's still consulted. He doesn't run anything in Cuba anymore. But he certainly is consulting. What happened in December 17 is a major event in the history of Cuba and U.S. relations because for the first time the President of Cuba and the President of the United States talked to each other, decided on a number of issues together in a show of mutual respect that, is, that it was rare before Cuba and U.S. relations, and started a process that is very, very new, it's like entering unknown territory. We don't know exactly where this is going to take us. Hopefully, and I am one of those who hopes that it will be uh, for a better relationship between Cuba and the United States, as it should be, because we are neighbors. And this is the first fact that we, that we should understand, is the first fact that I want to emphasize, and it will be the final fact that I would like to underline, neighbors. Neighbors has a lot of implication. 2013, the president of Cuba and the United States spoke at the funeral of Nelson Mandela in Johannesburg. And something happened that day that had never happened before, which was the president of Cuba and the president of the United States shaking hands. Such a simple act as shaking hands. As an old diplomat, when I saw that, I said, ho, ho. Something is cooking here. There's, some, there's something new, evident. These things don't happen, neither by mistake, nor by coincidence. They happen because the three sides have to plan it. He presented the idea of the normalization of Cuban-American politics and the politics behind that as it's really a set of issues that need to be solved before that we can even think about doing Well, there are many issues in the, in the air. Embargo, you call it embargo, we call it blockade, I am ready to compromise. There was the issue of Cuba and the list of stories of state that sponsored terrorism that many specialists were saying, why is Cuba there? It's not only bad for Cuba, it's bad for the list. Because you are keeping someone in the list for political reasons, not because they actually are involved with terrorism. But the most important issue probably was that as 2013 arrived, we were closing on on the summit of the Americas in Panama in April 2015. The United States must have a new policy towards Cuba, otherwise relations between the United States and Latin America and the Caribbean are not going to get better. Both Latin American and Caribbean leaders told President Obama at the next summit of the Americas in Panama in 2015, either Cuba is invited and you accept it, or we are not coming. President Obama faced a fact, faced the problem that he had to do something about Cuba. 
the American ambassador in Cuba who was in Havana, he was talking more about making progress on the Cuban side. And I think that makes a lot of sense that in a, they're kind of placing the strain of what needs to happen on the other party. Right? Because there's the social, right, um, social issues and human rights violations that need to be solved. Cuba said, oh yeah, now we have these private businesses, our economy is changing, tour tourism is increased, so now it's time for the U.S. to step up, change some of their policies, so now we can finally work together. Well, the U.S. has said we've um, weakened some of our stances on Cuba, we've been trying to work harder to come to an agreement, so now it's time for Cuba to get their human rights um, acts together, I guess. So I think it's interesting how each side has thought that they have done enough, and now that it's time for the other side to do that. Like it, it shows that like Americans are more like, well, Cuba, you have to change, and the Cubans are more like, well, America, you have to change. And I think for relations to be fully normalized, we have to realize that we both have to change, and that there's not really like only one side is bad, and that's not our side. About 18 months later, here you have Barack Obama and Raul Castro speaking at the Summit of the Americas. So it happened. At the Summit of the Americas, the United States agreed that Cuba should participate. The Cuban president participated. He there complained about whatever has been happening, but he also said, I believe Barack Obama is an honest man, and I, I am ready to make deals with him. So this is a big change. This is a fundamental change. And I think this is what a lot of politics is right now between the U.S. and Cuba is, yes, we need to lift the embargo, but exactly how we do it, how slowly we do it, you know, the steps we take, who should really be taking the lead role in the whole situation is what really differs between the Cuban side of the story that we had from the Cuban ambassador to the European Union, I believe, yeah. and then the American ambassador to Cuba. Right? And so... It's, it's, it's all about perspective. An American embassy can be, can play an intrusive role in Cuban politics. That's the history of our relation. In the old days, the American embassy was always involved in Cuban politics and supporting certain kinds of Cubans. From the Cuban perspective, to allow an American embassy in Cuba is a problem because there is also the question of asymmetry. The United States can have as large an embassy in Cuba as they want. Can we have as large an embassy in the United States? No, because we don't have resources. Well, I feel like the number one thing was kind of that the road to Cuba-American relationships um, will be like really long and hard and treacherous. That was like the number one thing that both of them yeah. said. But they both really felt like it was possible, which I felt like was a very important part. The first negotiation, successful negotiation between the two sides in the 60s actually ended in 1963. It was a negotiation about the release of the 1,200 uh, Cubans who had participated in the Bay of Pigs. Remember this, the Bay of Pigs was an invasion of Cuba. Organized by the CIA, financed by the CIA, but carried out by Cubans. When the negotiation ended, President Fidel Castro asked James Donovan, who was the, the American negotiator, how do you think that Cuba and the United States should start a process of normalization? Donovan said, does the Prime Minister know what a porcupine is? And Fidel Castro, yes, I know what a porcupine is. Well, like two porcupines making love very carefully because they can hurt each other. And what we're going to do together with President Obama and with the administration is start making deals, creating interest. But at the same time, like some of the, their, both their goals for collaboration, like yeah. environmental stuff and counterterrorism, like those goals were the same, which yeah. I thought was really significant, is that yes. you wouldn't think that uh, American ambassador and a Cuban, you know, representative would have similar goals for U.S.-Cuban collaboration, but they did. Yeah. Any candidate who wants to win an American election has to win Miami. To win Miami, he has to win the Cuban-American vote. To win the Cuban-American vote, you have to take a hard line on Cuba. Don't ever be put in a position to take a soft line on Cuba. There are 1.9 million Americans who proclaim themselves to be Cuban-Americans. Of those, 
700,000 were born in the United States. They are second or third generation Cuban Americans. Like Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, Bob Menendez, all these guys are second and third generation Cuban Americans. On the other hand, you might have on the Cuban side what I call the grass and elephant complex. It's about a Swahili proverb. What does the grass think about the elephant? And the grass thinks that it doesn't matter if the elephant is making war or making love, he will always trample on the grass. So you can find Cubans who say, I don't care what the United States is doing. It might seem all right from here, but it's going to be probably wrong. It's going to be damaging for me because the elephant doesn't care what he's doing. Uh, and I always tell my students, listen guys, do you think Dick Cheney and Bill Gates have the same idea about the United States? They say, no, of course not. Then don't think about the United States the way you're thinking about the United States. Try to learn from the Americans. Try to understand the Americans. And then you might be better, better placed to influence Americans to have a different view of Cuba, the view that you want uh, to have about Cuba. One of the things that the Cuban Revolution brought about, and that I don't think Cubans are ready to give up, is the sense of independence, the sense of self-determination. So the vision, the vision of Cuba as an enemy of the United States, as in a, a, replace, a, a reductible enemy of the United States, a, a terrible dictatorship. Uh, by the way, sometimes it is forgotten that the Cuban Revolution was against the, a dictatorship. I mean, socialism was not established in Cuba because Russian tanks came to establish it, as in most of Eastern Europe. Socialism was established in Cuba after a, a process of rebellion against a terrible dictatorship. The Batista dictatorship was terrible. This is recent history. This is not ancient history. This is something that is within living memory. People have uh, gone through these things and remember it uh, and can tell, talk about it, uh, versus something that happened a few centuries ago. Cuba is changing. Whatever Cuba in five years from now is going to be completely different. How is it going to be? Well, it's difficult. But Cubans are having more say in where we are going. Since Raul Castro took over in 2006, there hasn't been one anti-U.S. demonstration in 10 years. Instead, what there's been is a series of grassroots discussions where people were asked pretty point blank, what do you think's wrong with this place and what should we do about it? And it does show that they wanted people to speak their minds. If the embargo was lifted, how do you think that would change people and their mindset just kind of towards America and in general? Are all Cubans ready and wanting a full normalization of relations between the U.S. and Cuba? Okay. What we would like is that American companies come to Cuba and invest. They invest, uh, for example, we, we have an example here in Old Havana. In Old Havana, there is a rule. You come to invest in a building in Havana. We give you the building. Not The building cannot be owned by the foreign company. It can be rented or it can be taken into shape. But that company has to fix the two other buildings beside it. And at the same time, sponsor a school inside Old Havana. So those, those rules that have been increasing in Cuba, they're, they're rules that, that we apply. They've gone from blaming the outside world for all their problems to saying, I have my own problems and I have to deal with them regardless of the outside world. They're very proud to be Cuban. They're very proud of their history and of like who they were in the past and who they are today. At the same time, we're still dependent on somebody. So it was Americans, Soviets, then European tourists, then Venezuelans, and now what? Now if the embargo is lifted, then what? Who are we going to be dependent on, you know, and this is something that I think is becoming clear in, in Cuban politics, not just in the upper echelons, which is very clear there, but in the people, is that they have to have some sort of self-sustaining method. I had always heard the consequences of having a communist, a socialist government, how it was corrupt, how people were in poverty, how the streets were filthy, and I, that was always what my perception was. I was sort of striving to find the benefits of having a communist government, or specifically in the people. On the first day in Cienfuegos, we visited a market, market, and here, this is where I learned about the free food rations that, um, that, 
that the Cuban government gives its people. Now this isn't for a year, this isn't for a month, this is only for 15 days. And for the other days of the month, the people have to provide for themselves using their own savings. Even, even though in the United States we don't get free food, you have to pay for your own food. When we saw the food ration station, these were not stocked constantly. These were not taken care of. These were not sanitary. The way that they keep track of these food rations, the way that, they, um, that families keep track of what they've gotten, um, the foods that they get are rice, grains, oil, sugars, things like that. Um, some basic needs is that they have a like a book like this one and they just record of what they've gotten and what they've received throughout the months. It's not exactly quality, it's more quantity. The government is sort of striving to provide for every single person in Cuba and making sure that no one is starving in the streets. And that's one of the reasons that we see that we don't see any people that are looking like they're starving and they're dying of starvation. It's because the government is providing for them. The Cuban government though gives, it gives free health care, it gives ed free education, it gives free food for part, part of a month. It's not good quality compared to what you get in the United States. And what you have to accept here is that Cuba is a poor country, at least poorer than the United States. However, what the government is striving for is for every single person in the community, whether it's education, health care, or food rations, they are getting what they need, but not what they want. Um, we're never really going to see the full story. All we can try to do is consider all the perspectives out there and not necessarily revert back to our U.S. worldview and that everyone wants capitalism and everyone wants the most money and everyone wants the most power. And it's something like Erica said that some people are really just happy if they ha can go to the doctors for free and they can send their kids to a, a high school. And, you know, it's just important to consider that we and not everyone has the same value system that we do. Always. Uh having in mind that the more you learn, the, most you, the more you realize you don't know anything. <laughs> Thank you.